Amen. And I hope you can say it is well with your soul. That if you were to die right now, you'd have no regrets. You would be instantly in the presence of Jesus. You would be gazing into his eyes. You would be feeling the warmth of his, of his embrace. And hopefully you would hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And that is ultimately the goal. And my encouragement to you is to listen to the word of God. Do not harden your heart against the word of God. But it is your whole life is wrapped up in Jesus Christ and his word. And so if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 5. We, we, I spoke this morning about Jesus as the great high priest. You know why we need a high priest? We have no access to God. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to approach a holy, uh, the, the one and holy God, you would have to bring the death of a substitute. If you did not bring a dead animal with you, then you could not approach God. You approach him on your own merit, and you would be destroyed forever. Um, God dwells in unapproachable light, and certainly he does not dwell with sin. But praise God that we have a great high priest who not only is our high priest to give us access to God, but he is the perfect sacrifice. Through his death, he paid our sin, and all who believe in Jesus have eternal life, access to God through Christ. I have three points this evening as we look. I have, first of all, the reader's condition. What is the reader's condition here? If I can find my outline. And then we're going to look at the remedy. What do we do about it? And then we're going to close with a warning. And so let's begin. Let's pray first, and then we're going to pick it up here, really in verse 11. Hebrews 5:11. Let's pray. Our Father, we bow before you, and we are so grateful for this book of the Bible. It is a book written to believers about their spiritual growth and maturity. Oh, Father, so many believers around this world, true, genuine believers, they have put their faith in Jesus. They are not trusting their works. They're not trusting their religion. But they really do believe in Jesus. And yet they have never grown spiritually. They are like little babies in diapers learning A, Bs, and Cs when they ought to be teachers of maturity and spiritual growth and health and wisdom. And so I pray for our church. If there's any here that maybe are stuck in a pattern of no growth, maybe they're regressing, they're going from um, calculus down to simple addition and subtraction. And so, Father, spiritually help us to grow and to be more like Jesus day by day. Teach us and instruct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to cover these three points, and the warning here in, in Hebrews chapter 6 is actually one of the most uh, kind of controversial passages and a very difficult one, but I hope to walk you through it, and hopefully you can see as I explain the meaning of the text and the application, how it fits into your life. But let's pick up with the readers. The author of, of Hebrews, I believe it's a sermon that is being preached, he is, he is speaking and preaching to a certain group of people, and these people have begun to drift. You know how it is when you're fishing and you, you have a fishing boat there outside of your dock and then you lift up the anchor on a calm day and you don't pay any attention. You're busy doing other things, catching fish and doing this and that. And all of a sudden you look and you are no longer in front of your property, but the current has taken you down and you've, you've, you've started a drift. It doesn't sound like a big deal, but you know in geometry, if this is a straight line, if I'm one degree off of a straight line, it's not that far. One degree is not much at all. I'm so close to the line, you can, you can hardly tell the difference. But when you go a mile down the road, at one degree off, you are so far from center. And so drifting is, is bad. It's difficult. Because once you drift, it is hard to get back. You know, you got to go back up against the current and all of that. And so don't drift. Stay close to the Lord. Live a life with confessed sin. By the end of the night, look at your life, confess your sin, just to, not because the relationship is broken between a, a child, a son or daughter, and the Lord. You'll never lose your relationship by faith alone. You're saved for eternity. You are eternally secure. But you'll lose that, that parental fellowship. 
And you want to keep that fellowship restored. And, and so you want to have a soft heart towards sin, a soft heart towards the Lord and his word. So don't drift. Then we saw in Hebrews, there was a second danger. And the danger was, was doubting. Simply not believing God's word. Oh, I know what God's word says, but I'm not going to do it. I don't believe it. Kind of like those wilderness wanderings. When God told Israel, you will go into the land and I will give it to you. You don't even have to put up a fight. Sure, the people are tall and you're small and they're strong and you're weak. But I am your God. You go into the promised land and I will defeat the enemy for you and I will give you all of this land for free. And what did the nation Israel say? We don't believe you. We doubt. We don't believe you. And God was so angry, he swore in, their, in his wrath, you will never enter into this rest and you will die in the wilderness. A lot of believers just don't trust God's word and they end up dying in the wilderness. They don't lose their salvation, but their usefulness is dried up and they have really a life that has no joy and no, no service for the Lord. But here is the third issue. Verse 11. Remember that the writer has been talking to these people about Melchizedek and the high priest of Jesus Christ. Now in verse 11, regarding Melchizedek, of whom this character, and by the way, in Hebrews 7, we'll deal with Melchizedek in depth. Who is he? But anyways, of whom this man named Melchizedek, we have much to say and hard to explain because it is. But listen to this. Since you have become dull of hearing. This is the third warning. Not only have they been drifting, not only are they doubting God's word, bringing upon some discipline, but now they're dull of hearing. This word dull, it means sluggardly. It just means lazy. Like, they don't open their Bibles. They don't come to church. They're not in the assembly to hear the word of God explained and taught. They don't go to Bible studies. They're just sluggardly. They're lazy. They would rather sit on a couch and watch some sports. They would rather go to the mall. They would rather do just about anything else than sit in a, a church service to hear the word of God, to sing the word of God, and to pray the word of God. They're dull of hearing. It's lazy, sluggardless. Uh, by the way, the same word is found in Hebrews 6, verse 12. So go to Hebrews 6, verse 12. That you do not become sluggish. Same word. Sluggish and dull of hearing. Same word. So this is written to the same group of people. They're all believers that, that the writer is speaking to. So whatever is going on in the text is written to you and I as believers. So can I ask you, have you become dull of hearing? Is it now an effort to come to church? Is it an effort to read your Bible? Is it an effort to do spiritual things? To listen to the word of God is just a chore. That tells you, listen, you know how when you're driving the car and all of a sudden the idiot lights come on, the, like the low tire gauge and the fuel gauge is flashing and all of this? If you don't pay attention to those gauges, what happens? Your car is going to stop. And if you don't listen to the, the Holy Spirit working in your life, um, your service to the Lord and your rewards in the future will just be about over. You'll still be saved. You'll still go to heaven, but no rewards. So these people have become dull of hearing. Look at verse 12. Not only are they dull of, of hearing, that's, there's four things about these people. Number one, they were dull of hearing. Number two, they were unable to teach others. Verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you should be teachers of spiritual things. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. Oracles of God is simply a way of saying the word of God. You just need the first, you need the basics again. You ought to be spiritual teachers, helping others, being useful to others in the spiritual life with the word of God. But you need somebody to teach you the basics all over again. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. You know, when I was a child, my mother's here. Well, hello, mom. How you doing? When I was a child, my mom did not cut up a nice T-bone steak when I was a month old or two months old and say, chew on it, Brian. Get some, get some protein. No, I had milk. Because that's all I could handle when I was that little. But then as I began to develop and my teeth came in, my incisors and whatever types of teeth I might have, um, as those became, then I could chew on meat. And my mom would give me a hot dog or a hamburger and once in a while a steak. So same thing here. These people, they should have been teaching others, but they needed to be taught the basics themselves. Do you understand that even though some people have a special gift of teaching, we all ought to be teaching others? Anything you learn in the Word of God, in your devotions, something you hear in church, you ought to be able to pass to somebody else this week and say, hey, you know what I heard in church on Sunday? Oh, do you know what we did in Bible study? Do you know what we had in Sunday school? And then 
John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. You just heard those verses tonight. You could turn around and share those with somebody. You could say, hey, I heard a man's testimony. He quoted Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Do you want to know what those mean? Let me tell you what those mean. And now you can teach others also. But these people were babes. They should have been mature, but they were babies. Spiritual babies. Hey, do you want to know something about spiritual babies? Oh, well, first of all, what do you know about babies? They don't have a lot of discernment. You drop a Cheerio on the ground. Man, I wouldn't touch that thing for my life. But what does a little baby do with the Cheerio that falls on the ground and is all gummy and sticky? Pops it right in their mouth. No discernment. And these spiritual babies, no discernment. Is it good? Maybe. Is it bad? Who cares? I'll do it. Is this a bad thing to watch? Is this a bad thing to eat? Is this a bad thing to drink? Is this a bad thing? Whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter to me. So they need to be taught the basic principles of Christ again. Thirdly, look at verse 13. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. If somebody is only on a milk diet, all, there is getting is, all they're getting is that Jesus died for me and rose from the dead. You know, you're a babe and, and you're unskilled in the word of righteousness. Uh, you're, you're just a babe, just a little one. Um, thirdly, they not only, first of all, they weren't only dull of hearing. Secondly, they had the inability to teach the word of God to others. But third, they were stuck on an on a elementary diet of the, the basics. Their whole spiritual diet was the basics. They didn't want to get into Jeremiah and Lamentations and who is Melchizedek. How does Melchizedek play into the Aaron priesthood? What is a priest? What is the tabernacle? Why a tabernacle? All of these things. So they were unskilled in the word of righteousness. They were partaking only of milk. They were simply being fed a diet of the basics. At some point, listen, everybody, if you've been saved for any length of time, you need to get into the word of God and you need to know it. You need to learn, what is Hosea all about? Why did God have Hosea marry Gomer, who was going to be an unfaithful wife, and prostitute herself? And then he would chase after her? And he would keep her in the house and say, listen, honey, I don't want you to go and find another man and sleep with him tonight. Stay home tonight. And she, he'd wake up at three in the morning and Gomer is off sleeping with a man down the street. And then he put a hedge in front of the house and he said, honey, I don't want you to go. You're going to have to crash through the hedge to find a man. And she does it anyways. She ends up in Hosea 3 as a slave, a naked slave in the marketplace, used and abused by so many men. And Hosea is like, I'm going to put my money together and go and purchase her. She's mine. I'm going, to, I'm going to love her no matter what. What a picture of God's love for us. No matter how filthy we get in the world, he loves us and he has purchased us. I mean, we need to know these things. We need to think about these things. Well, and then lastly, verse 14, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, meaning they're growing up in maturity. That is those who by means of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The fourth thing these people didn't, what they had was they did not apply the word of God to their lives. They did not exercise their spiritual senses. Now, you, you probably can tell I haven't been to the gym lately. My muscles are flabby. They're not so strong. I haven't been running. I haven't been walking. My whole body feels it. But when I'm exercising, my muscles are, then I have strength in my body and I can feel it. Same thing spiritually. If I'm not exercising skill in the word of God with discernment, I hear something. Is that biblical? Is it of the Bible? Should I do this? What does God's word say about doing this? Should I click on pornography on my computer? Should I have a relationship with somebody who's not my wife? What does the Bible say? And, and you look at it and you exercise spiritual maturity by discerning what is good. What, oh, wait a minute. Who in our family of mankind was first encountered with a choice of good and evil. Remember? Adam and Eve. You've got a tree of life, which is good. You've got a tree of knowledge and evil, good and evil, which you eat of it, you shall surely die. So we're back to the same position. We're evaluating everything. Is it good and healthy and wholesome? Does it please Christ? Does it not? And then spiritual maturity makes the choice of pleasing Christ, no matter what the pain no matter what the loss of relationship, the loss of money, if it means, listen, 
I have talked to people over the years and they've said, Pastor, I wanna, I'm going to move away and I'm, I want to make a, I got a job offer, I'm going to make a ton of money. And I'm like, have you found a local church? Have you, have you found a local church so that you know you can spiritually grow? Because you can have all the money with this new job, but if you don't have the word of God and a place to serve, you are going to regret that in the future, in the eternal state. You will regret it for all eternity. See these choices we need to make? Well, this is the issue with the Hebrews. Verse chapter 6. Therefore, here's the remedy. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. Let us go on to perfection is in the passive tense, which is critical. It's not let us go on in our own strength, like I'm doing it. The passive tense means I'm going to go on to something, but somebody else is enabling me to do it. It's God through the Holy Spirit who is enabling me to go on and press on in, ma in maturity. Listen, class. Listen, people. I want you to press on to spiritual maturity. I don't want you to be babes, babes in Christ, in diapers, drinking only milk, and then doing crazy things like eating Cheerios off the ground. I want you to grow up spiritually and live for Christ. Live godly lives. And it's going to be hard because some of the godly choices you make are not going to be the most pleasant for you physically. You may have to deny yourself. You may have to lose your friends. You may have to lose your job. Who knows what you have to do? But ultimately, in the whole big picture, it is worth it. It is worth it. So what's the remedy to this spirit, this, this dull of hearing situation? Let us go on to, the idea of go on to perfection is go on to maturity. Go on to the, you know what maturity is? Spiritual maturity is Christ-like. If you were to ask my wife, am I more spiritual? Am I more Christ-like this year than last year? Don't ask her. But if you were to ask her, what should she say? She should say, yes, I've seen change. He has a more tender heart. He's more concerned about the last. He's in the word of God. He's leading our family. And she should be saying those things rather than, wow, what an obstinate fool. Can't get him off the couch to do anything. What a lazy sluggard. What dull of hearing. What a drifter. So let us go on to perfection. Let's, let's go on to maturity. Sometimes people have a medical condition that when they're born, they never grow physically. And they can be 25, 30, 40 years old in diapers and still just basically doing baby things. It, it happens. And a lot of believers can be like that. I'm not saying you are, but I'm just challenging you. I just, so let us go on to perfection, verse 1 says. Not laying again. See the word again? Now this is going to be a big part of my interpretation of the text. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Now in these verses in chapter 6, stay with me, you're going to find six things that describe the basics of the Christian life. Six things. There's there's two, two things about God. They're centered on God. Two things that are centered on man. And then two things that are centered on the future. But these are what we would call the basics. Not laying, again, the basics. You know, like once you lay the foundation of a house, you're foolish to keep working on the foundation. Put the walls up. Get a, get a, get a roof on the place. But don't lay the foundation. Again, you don't have to. It's already done. You agree? Very foolish if somebody was building a house... They've got a nicely laid foundation, and then they're like, um, let's tear that down and do it again, and then let's tear that down and do it again, and all they do is build the foundation. You'd be like, put the walls up and live in the place, for crying out loud, right? So here it says, not laying again, which, which means what? They've already laid it. So don't lay it again. You've already been here. Let's move on. What have, where have they been? Here's the things toward God. Repentance from dead works. They had a complete change of mind about their system of works. Their works will not get them to heaven. Their religion, their good deeds will not get them to heaven. They are dead. Dead works will never get you to a living God. 
Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, not by works, lest any man should boast. Faith, uh, it is by grace through faith alone that we are saved, not of works. We receive eternal life by faith. So you don't have to lay that over again. You're not laying again the foundation of repentance from good works. Um, or here's the second, the second part of the coin, faith toward God. Repentance and faith, two sides of the same coin. If you stop trusting your dead works, you're trusting the true and living God, Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you will perish forever in a lake of fire. If you put your faith in Jesus, you can have the same kind of response and testimony of Bill and Bonnie. Praise God for that. So don't lay again this foundation of repentance from good works and faith toward God. That's God word. That's your justification. Look at verse 2. Here are the man word things of the doctrine of baptisms of laying on of hands. Now, some people think these are Judaism things, but I think they're basics of Christianity. You know what the doctrine of baptisms plural are? There's a water baptism by immersion. Then there's a baptism found in Matthew 3 of the Lord Jesus. He baptizes the believer with the Holy Spirit, he, which is a dry one. He baptizes the unsaved with fire in the lake of fire. That's what it's called. They're called baptisms. There's in 1 Corinthians 10, a baptism of Moses. So you've got many baptisms, not just one. There's only one that's by immersion to identify with the death and resurrection of Jesus. But there's a doctrine of baptisms. And then there's a doctrine of laying on of hands. When you have a pastor or a deacon and the church has selected them to lead, um, you lay your hands on them to show that the whole church is behind the recognition that God has called this person to an office. There's nothing mystical, no grace is parted by the laying on of hands, but it's simply an identification. It's the idea of the whole church recognizes God has called this man to lead us as a shepherd or to serve us as a deacon. And so these are, man, these are things that man can see, baptisms and then the laying on of hands. And then thirdly, these future things of resurrection of the dead, like that's a basic you put your faith in Jesus, you will rise from the dead in glory. End of eternal judgment. Those who do not believe in Jesus, you may live a long life and you may have lots of fun, but you will ultimately end a lake of fire and uh, never get out. So these are the foundation. These are just ABCs. Class, what are we going to do? Not lay them again. We don't have to keep repeating them. We believe them and know them. We want to move on to maturity. So this key thing about not laying them again. Now, look at verse 3, and this we will do if God permits. We want to press on from those to greater spiritual truths or more spiritual truth if God permits, if he allows. Now, here is the, the text, verse 4. Something is going to be impossible. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again. See the word again? To renew them again to repentance. So back in verse 1, did we have this issue of not laying again the foundation of repentance? Now we have it's impossible to renew them to repentance again to renew them again to repentance. So those two phrases are going to tie together, verse 1 and verse 6. Since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. All right, let's figure this out. First of all, my view is that this is written to believers, not unbelievers. So starting with chapter 5, verse 11, do not be dull of hearing. Chapter 6, verse 12, do not be sluggardly or dull of hearing. Those are the bookends. And the whole pericope in between is for believers. So you, you already, can I show you how I know it? it's believers? Look at all of these things in verse 4. For it is impossible for those believers, those who were once enlightened. Unbelievers are not enlightened by the Holy Spirit. They may see some things or maybe know some things, but they're not truly enlightened. These individuals were once enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. This word taste is used in chapter 2 where it says Jesus Christ has tasted death for everyone. Did Jesus really die? Yes, when he tasted death for everyone, he fully died. If you have tasted here in this verse, if you, had tasted, if you have tasted the heavenly gift, you have received it all. It's not like you sampled it, but you didn't put it in your stomach. 
Some people say you just put it in your mouth and spit it out again like an unbeliever. This taste, if you have tasted the heavenly gift, you are truly born again. Otherwise, Jesus, when he tasted death, he just put it in his mouth and spit it out. He didn't really experience it all for us. So here they tasted the heavenly gift. They have become partakers, partakers of the Holy Spirit. That's only believers. Look again at the next phrase. And have tasted, same word, the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. Look at verse 6. If they fall away. Here's my big point. In order to fall away, can an unbeliever fall away? No, they're already away. Unbelievers, how, how can you fall away unless you're first there? So these are real believers. There's something, okay, you want the application? There's something, and I want you to get this. There's something for a believer that is impossible, and you need to know what it is. There's something, if you're a believer, that is impossible to do. It is impossible for these believers, if they fall away, fall away means you go away from the Lord and you do not grow in maturity. You stay at the ABCs, you serve the world, you love the world, but you're not growing in maturity with Christ. You're not passionate about the word of God. You're not involved in a local church. You're not serving and using your spiritual gifts. If you fall away, something is impossible. What is it? It is impossible to renew them again. See the word again? To renew them again to repentance goes back to verse 1. You can't lay again the foundation of your, of your justification. Here's my view. And again, it is a hard passage, but my view is this. It is impossible for a believer who falls away from the Lord to erase their record of failure to erase or to remove all of the wrongs and the record of failure, the spiritual immaturity, to have a whole clean slate, and then to be saved again. To go back and to be, to go back and, and repent again in the sense of, I want a clean slate and I want to start all over with my walk with the Lord. It's impossible to renew that person again to repentance. They cannot lose their salvation, lose their whole track record of, of uh, immaturity, and then get saved again and start from there. So listen, when I was 26, I put my faith in Jesus. Before I was saved, none of that counts regarding my rewards or not. But from 26 on, I have been serving the Lord and God is accruing for me in heaven spiritual rewards that I'll get someday. Now, can you imagine if I had lived 30 years, because now I'm 30 years old spiritually, if I had lived 30 years in spiritual immaturity, I would be like, oh, I wish I could get saved again right now, and then God would not count the last 30 years. You know, then I can start now. As a school teacher, here's how I think of it. In school, we get a semester grade. They started in the middle of January, and they're going to end in June. I have students that have an F right now, and you know what they wish? They wish they could clear off that F and start fresh right now. They can't. It's going to come the end of April when we're a month away from the end of school. And they're going to say, Mr. Wida, I wish I could clear out the whole F, all the failures that I did, all the work I didn't turn in. If you could just erase that record of wrong and just start the class right now, I'll do good at the end and get an A. Listen, everybody, you have one life to offer to the Lord. From the moment of salvation when you started your race until the day you get to heaven, however long that is, you have one life to offer to the Lord. Mine started at 26, and whatever happened that I don't like in the last 30 years, I cannot erase that record of wrong. It is impossible for me to say, Lord, let's just skip the last 30 years and let's start fresh right now. I'll just be born again right now, and then um, you can just take my track record from now until I die. Wouldn't that be nice? I've made a lot of foolish mistakes in the last 30 years. I'd love those to be wiped from my record, but I can't. Do you see how important living your life right now for Christ is? Let's say you were saved years ago, and you had some years of fruitfulness, but right now you are not there. You're not living for the Lord. You're drifting, doubting, and dull of heart, dull of hearing. I can tell you this, and it grieves me to tell you this, but you cannot erase your record of wrong as a believer. You're, you, will have, you will have a loss of rewards. It's impossible for you to renew yourself again to repentance, to go back 
erase the record and start fresh like you did when you were first saved. You have, you have one life to present to God someday. And do you want to go to the Lord and say, well, Lord, I was saved for 30 years and I wasted most of it on myself. I did not live like you wanted me to. Um, I, we don't, I don't want that for you. I want you to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, from the time I was saved, I kept my eyes on Jesus. And I stumbled and I went here and there, but I got back on track and I kept my eyes on you and thank you for whatever you could accomplish in my life. It was all by your grace. It was all by your spirit. But I kept my eyes on you. I kept my eyes on you. And there were times when I wanted to quit and I wanted to walk away and never go to church again. Honest confession. I never wanted to go to church again. I actually sat with my wife and said, I don't ever want to, I don't, actually, I can be a good Christian without anybody else. I can, just, I can just read my Bible and pray every day. You can't. You can't. You need the body of Christ. So you have one life to offer Jesus. What will you do with it? It's not too late. You can start right now. And whatever record of wrong that cannot be erased, you can start right now. And from now until the rapture, from now until your death, you can faithfully look unto Jesus, the author of your, and finisher of your faith. See what a blessing that is? Now look at how, so again, let me tell you this. Verse 4, it's a believer. It's impossible. It is impossible if you've been saved, if you've been enlightened, you've tasted the heavenly gift, you've become a partaker of the Holy Spirit, you've tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. If it is impossible if you fall away to renew yourself again to repentance. You can't just erase the record and be born again. Because it says you would then crucify again. See the word again? You would crucify again for yourselves the Son of God. You'd be like saying, well, the first salvation didn't take, and so I'll let Jesus be crucified a second time. I'll start my salvation over a second time. You can't. Once you're saved, you're saved. And it's up to you what you're going to do with your track record. If you're going to run the race or not. So he's going to go on. Here's the illustration, verse 7. It's pretty easy. Oh, you, you would put Jesus to an open shame. Do you know that? If you're saved and you've, you've just messed up your, self, your, your uh, sanctification, you've just not lived like you ought, you put him to an open shame. And, but you can change. There's always hope. I love it. So verse 7. For the earth, this is an obvious one, for the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessing from God. It, listen, everybody, if you believe the word of God and you pursue Christ, you pursue the word of God, you will be like the rain that hits the earth and it bears herbs that are, help. you know, you put a little herbs in your spaghetti sauce, it tastes delicious. You put some, I don't know, wherever you use herbs, whatever you do with herbs, it's useful and it's a blessing. If you serve Christ, if you let the word of God take effect in your heart, you will bear fruit and it's a blessing to God and to everybody around you. Here's the alternative. Verse 8, but if it bears thorns and briars, the same rain hits the same earth, but you don't get herbs useful for others to bless God. You, you bear thorns and briars. That's a believer who is wasting their life. They are not serving Christ like they ought. If it, if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed. Listen, nobody grabs thorns and briars, cuts them and puts them on the vase, in a vase and says to their wife, Happy Valentine's Day, I love you. Thorns and briars. My wife would like, I don't know what she would do. You don't do that. What do you do with thorns and briars? You, you burn them. When we get to the reward seat of Christ, anything we did good for Christ will last as a reward. Anything that was not for Christ will be burned up. 1 Corinthians 3. And then we're gonna, we do have to end with these verses. I know we're just a little bit over time, but hang with me because we have to end with verse 12. But beloved, this is very obvious. We are confident of better things concerning you. Listen, Faith Baptist, I am confident that there are better things for you than that. Far better for your Christian life concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation. The good works and the fruit that accompany your, your spiritual life, your justification, though we speak in this manner. Verse 10, for God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. You know who's keeping track of every good deed you do? 
as a believer, God is keeping a account of the records up in heaven. And every good deed you do to others, he keeps track of and he will reward you for. So if you've wasted the last 30 years, you can't like get that erased. You can't. It's impossible for you to erase that record of wrong. What you can do is remember that God up in heaven is watching and empowering you to do good and he keeps track of every single thing and he will reward you at the end. Now, every two, every two weeks, every month, every two weeks, I have no idea. The high school rewards me for being diligent in a math class. They, do, like, they give me something for showing up and doing my duty. I don't think anything of it. I just go and do my duty, which I love to do, at the school to teach, and they reward me for it. But how far better that the God of heaven someday will reward me for these little things that I do during this earthly pilgrimage. So I would rather do more good for God than be thorns and briars that will be near to being cursed and burned up. And then he says, verse 11, And we desire that each one of you, every single person, show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Listen, everybody, as we close, on your deathbed, and listen, I've been at many deathbeds this last year, what, I think 14 or 15 since um, June, and um, not necessarily, I haven't necessarily been at the deathbeds, but um, others are coming. And I can't tell you how many people over the years, I've been at, at them on their deathbed, and they said, Pastor, I have regrets. One in particular, it was about uh, 10 or 11 o'clock at night down at the hospital. I was with a friend. He grabbed my hand and he said, Pastor, I messed up. I didn't take God seriously. I came to church and I did this and that, but I, I should have put more passion and more energy in serving the Lord than I did. And now I have cancer and I'm going to die and it's too late. And he knew he could not erase the record of wrong. It's impossible to renew himself again to repentance. He could, he could come back to the Lord, but he couldn't, he couldn't renew, he, he couldn't erase that record of wrong. He had to live with it. And he had regrets. But I, I want, I, I, my goal is I want to die and I, I don't want to have any regrets. I don't want to say, oh, I wish I could have served better or harder or longer or whatever. I just don't want regrets. And so my, I want you to have full assurance of hope until the end. Verse 12, do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Yeah, don't be lazy about spiritual things, but imitate, who do we imitate? Abraham. That's going to be Sunday morning. We're going to imitate Abraham. And then we're going to look at Hebrews 11 and imitate all those people as well. And then I'm going to imitate Bill and Bonnie and their faith in the Lord. And I praise God for that example. And all of you, as you serve the Lord, are examples that I can follow. Do you understand that? This church has many examples that I can follow after for endurance and patience in their Christian life. So don't quit. Don't give up. Don't be dull-hearted, dull of hearing. Don't be sluggardly. Is that, if that's a word? but bear fruit for the Lord. Remember, you only have one life to live. So let's do a great job serving the Lord this next week in the power of the Spirit. Father, thank you for this Hebrews text, and I'm already excited about next Sunday morning, thinking about Abraham and the oath you made to Abraham and his response to it, and even Jesus, the forerunner who enters into heaven and pulls us safely there. Like, this is the most incredible text. And then going into chapter 7 with Melchizedek and on and on, you are one amazing God that has given us your word that will bring fruit in our life. So help us to love you and serve you, even though we cannot erase any record of wrong up until this point. Tonight and tomorrow and the rest of our life, we can press toward the mark. We can look at Jesus, our Savior, and do what pleases you. Thank you for this church family. And Father, I'm not really speaking to them. I'm speaking to my own heart. Thank you for these faithful men and women to set an example before me that I might follow, but help me to be that kind of individual as well. And we together will run this race looking unto Jesus. Amen. All right, God bless you, faith family. Don't forget, uh, Tuesday night we have men's Bible study at 615 at Travis's. We're having just an incredible time in Ephesians. Uh, Wednesday dinner, it's um, grilled cheese, some other kind of sandwich. 
ham and cheese and then soup. Then we have our prayer meeting, youth group. Um, don't, yeah, and then be praying for the Easter plane. Thank you, everybody. God bless.